in studio with New York Times bestselling author, the social assassin, John Gilstrap. Johnny, good morning. Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey is not here in a prosecutorial manner, just as a co-host. Not that you're aware of. Uh, I'm out of jurisdiction here. This is Berkeley County, so I'm oh, just you can do anything here's you a want. Co-host. I feel Australia. better now. Anything that you want. Yeah, just let me have it. anything that you want. <laughs> I like before the show. John quizzes Harvey on some legal maneuvers, which I'm sure are always included in the next book coming up. John's you know verifying I'm in my last chapter. Here's what I said happened. Is that plausible? I'm very I'm very upfront. I said it's a research question. It goes to the structure of certain parts of the West Virginia government. I'm writing a series, a new series, uh, and it's set in West Virginia, and it's. It, there's always political corruption because that's what I write, and it's not it's not so much about plot points, but you get in trouble if you get the structure of government wrong. And I'm new enough here that I don't really. Mm. Un- mm-hmm. It's what you don't know. That's right. It's the little details that'll get you in trouble. That's right. So. And people pick up on that. Oh yes, and they and they will send emails. And other stuff. Yes, they will. <laughs> Do you ever uh, intentionally make get something wrong just to? see if it has stickiness and attracts other people or as a persuasion technique not for that purpose but i have created for example this new series is set in jenkins county which is in the eastern panhandle of west virginia would you say jenkins county jenkins county which is not it's a made up knowledge county. it's a made up well, county not, because, well because i don't want i don't want to invite 56 heartache but i can Myrtle also Beach. i can also make up roads and i can move stuff around but still put in enough landmarks to make people feel comfortable you know sort of why don't you just use the actual name of the county well because if the jefferson county prosecutor is corrupt you would be upset yes he would be you see i would be right I'd be very so, upset but he did start with je so J- <laughs> Jenkins. Yeah. so that's yeah. that's why you don't it's like um what i wrote I would, can, if i pay you money can he can the Jeff, the jenkins county prosecutor be tall good looking and filthy rich just like the and, Jefferson County prosecutor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he is filthy rich from all the corruption, Matt. <laughs> um, uh, I've heard that. <laughs> no, you can't, you, can't, you can't dictate what the backgrounds of characters are. Our guest in this segment is Delegate Larry Kump, or you may have heard his voice a couple of seconds ago. Larry, good morning to you. Good, great googly moogly, and uh, for sure and for certain, may God bless you all real good. Hey, uh, your 60-day session is over, but in April you do go back for another uh, couple of days. Do you know when those dates are? Um, yeah, it's later in the month. I'll have to take a peek here. Um, it looks like they're going to be the 15th, the 16th, and the 17th. Do you know what you have planned for those three days? Nope. I have not a clue. In May, you have a greater uh, task because you're dealing with some budget issues and such still in May. But uh, April, right. uh, do, do these things tend to be minor things that come up in these uh, months like April? Uh, generally, it's background information and hashing over uh, issues that we're looking to uh, consider for the uh, the next uh, actual session mm-hmm. of, of the legislature. So, uh, uh, a lot of uh, information flows around. Some of it's helpful. Some of it's tedious. When do you usually get notification of what will be on the agenda? A couple of days before. And are they items specific in that we're going to look at this particular yes, piece they're, of, they're of specific. law? Yes, there's, there's an agenda for each each committee that has uh, that has a meeting. So the agenda is very specific. And are these usually further continuations of what you worked on during the 60-day? That and also new things. Um, a lot of background information, a lot of presenters that uh, are giving us information on, on issues that were, you know, that uh, is a big big public concern or might be a public concern things that coming down the pike let's talk about this past session what did you guys get right what did you get wrong well you know it's interesting um legislators are well aware that the only constitutional duty that the legislature has is to uh, pass the budget we could go in pass the budget and say sine die and we're done mm-hmm. uh, and i've seen a lot of opinions and I have my own opinion of what went on in the legislature. Um, it reminds me of the the old saw about an optimist thinks the glass is half full and the pessimist thinks it's half empty. Me, I just wonder who's been drinking my soda pop. Uh, 
But uh, my favorite cartoonist, Walt Kelly, Pogo Possum, uh, he made a quote that always stuck with me. He says, we have met the enemy and he is us. And I think that's what happened with the session this year. I've been in and out of the legislature since 2010. And of all the sessions I've been involved in, I think this was the least productive of all of them. Uh, the most productive, oddly enough, was the COVID session mm -hmm. when legislators came down and they didn't know how long they'd be there. They didn't know what was going to happen. There was a lot of quarantine uh, going on. And in that year, the leadership uh, of the House and the leadership of the Senate got together and said, OK, we don't know how long we're going to be down here. Uh, things are kind of iffy. So let's bang out and agree to five or six items that are important. They got them done. They got them through. This year, to the best of my knowledge, the leadership of the House and the Senate did not get together. If they did, they certainly didn't tell anybody in the House of Delegates, and it showed. Uh, so I, I, uh, if, if you give it a grade, uh, Speaker Hanshaw was on here recently, and he gave it a grade of B. I thought about that for a while, and I would give it a C. Do you think part of that was because you had the double election year, the four-year cycle, where, uh, and, and everybody, it seemed, is running for something else this year, higher up? I think that was part of it. The other part of it was the clawback provision that we had to look at with the, with the money that we didn't know if we were going to owe another four or $500 million to the federal government. And I think a lot of it, and I saw this coming when we got the super-duper majority in the House and the Senate, uh, a lot of infighting. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember one bill, which I thought was fairly innocuous. Uh, it was the put the in God we trust uh, motto in all the schools. Um, there's a lot of contention about that, even within our caucus. We had people arguing, saying, well, I like that idea, but what size should the sign be? It, w it was that kind of discussion, and it just wasn't productive. John Gilstrap. What do you think is the source? Take that as an example. Okay. Um, is it that there's just not enough to do? It occurs to me that last session we had the tax cuts and, and the, there was a lot of meaty, or there were a lot of meaty subjects to talk about, and the, the infighting was along those lines mm -hmm. between the House and the Senate and, and the governor actually getting involved with, with all of it. It seemed like there just wasn't a lot of, there weren't a lot of meaty issues. So in the absence of substantive issues, is it, is that why there was so much time spent on softer things like font size? No, I, I don't think that was that was the issue. We have a lot of meaty issues. Uh, generally, when I get in the legislature, I get up when I'm down there at my apartment. I get up about three o'clock, start banging around on the computer at four a.m., and I'm in the in, in the state house office at six. I put about ten hours in a day. The last day of the session, I put in twenty hours. Uh, it was really really busy. But it wasn't productive. Uh, for instance, uh, we had a unusual joint caucus of the Republicans and the Senate and the and the House on the last day of the session, which took several hours, which sucked up a lot of time. We had a big issue about the unemployment bill, uh, and the Senate's been pushing that, and some of the Senate leadership has been pushing that for good reason, because with the triggers and the COVID we had, there there was some drain in the uh, unemployment fund, uh, and that needed to be looked at. I think that the bill that the Senate was pushing was mean-spirited, uh, that um, it wasn't the best way to go. We had several iterations of that bill. The House just wasn't buying it, and it kept changing, it kept changing, it kept changing. What finally passed, uh, they took care of the trigger problem, more or less, uh, and essentially just froze the benefits and the uh, contributions. Uh, but uh, that bill held a lot of other bills hostage uh, because the Senate wasn't going to pass many of the other House bills until that unemployment bill was, was, was passed. And that just caused everything, more or less, to come to a dead, spot, dead, dead stop. Was that recalcitrance? Until I get this, you don't get that? Yeah. That, in my opinion, that was. Uh, and it's unfortunate. Again, I think we need to go back to what happened previously. The House and Senate leadership get together, say, what do we agree on? Let's agree to move these bills through uh, and have some agreement, and then we can argue about the rest of the stuff. Matt Harvey. Delegate Comp, 
Good morning. Good morning. Uh, is there any bills th- that you believe are targeted for an override veto or to override the, the veto of the governor for the special sessions? I don't think so. I, d- I don't think I don't see any appetite for it. The, the one bill that he did veto was the funding for West Virginia University. Uh, the best of my knowledge, with my information that I have that was vetoed because the Senate added some extra money on it without any really focus on it and the governor vetoed it. I think that's going to be fixed in the special session. I don't anticipate uh, any veto activity. Of course I could be wrong but I haven't seen any appetite. Would the vaccine bill veto the exemption for vaccines of school age children? You know, that's a possibility, but I think that's a slim possibility. I think what happened by the governor vetoing that, uh, I think, because again, this is just my opinion, he'd have been smart just to let it become law without his signature. By vetoing it, that made it an issue again. It's going to come up in the next legislature. Um, so that issue is certainly not certainly not dead. So if it comes back in the next legislature uh, because of the veto, well, obviously there will be a different governor. Exactly. Um, do you see it's, that the exemptions are going to be expanded, or it's going to be a, a slimmer bill? That's that, that's interesting because I lost. I saw the different iterations of of that that bill, and uh, I'm not anti-vaxxer by any cha- by any means. I have all the vaccines that uh, you you can uh, you can imagine, uh, but uh, my concern on the vaccine bill is I believe that people should have informed consent. Uh, I don't like any government mandates. If somebody's concerned about coming down with any kind of disease or their children, then they should be vaccinated. Uh, but if they don't want to be vaccinated, I don't think there should be a mandate. So I, I think there is quite a large majority within the Republican caucus that uh, wants to see that, that freedom of choice uh, uh, come through. How that comes out into the actual um, structure of the bill is anybody's guess. What should the legislator fo- have focused on this session? There's a lot of things they should have focused on. One of the bills that um, really concerns me, uh, and this relates in part to the unemployment issue, uh, the unemployment bill that passed essentially didn't do much, uh, except it did put some vague things in about you really ought to be looking for work if you're getting unemployment benefits. But my concern, and this is a big concern, is the workforce participation in West Virginia. It's gotten a little better, but West Virginia is still the worst of all the 50 states. I think we need to do much more to encourage workforce participation uh, rather than be punitive in some of these things. Uh, And I'm also, related to that, I've seen that uh, absenteeism with school children and teachers is high in West Virginia. So I think we need to address that. And, of course, uh, one of the things that uh, the bills that didn't get passed, it got through the Senate, got through the House committee, but didn't get time on the floor because of the other log jams we had, was the um, ability for teachers to uh, take really unruly students out of the class that, to, uh, be dis- that were disruptive to the classroom. I think that would be a big plus for, for our education. Years students. old, black female, black hair. That didn't happen. And, of course, we've got the ongoing thing. Uh, and my wife's not listening because she's got Bodacious Bob, our, the wonder dog, the vet right now. But she just unloaded on me yesterday about the road system. She says she feels like she's driving on corduroy when she goes up and down I-81. Yeah, when did, I mean, other, other states resurface their highways every other year or so. And 81, they, they finally finish this section of it and now they're just going to patch a seam or a pothole every now and then there's no no resurfacing to smooth it out every every year or two well and that's my my wife's observation to me she says good grief when they make the repairs how competent are the people that are making the repairs because it seems like it's almost worse yeah after well, the repair it's like it's been strafed by a jet fighter or something so you're coming down 81 you hit a, a pothole and you have to pull off and check your your tires and you grab something to eat at one of our local restaurants you think it's a plan uh, uh, yes the tourism department it's a tourism yeah Yeah. all Uh, right i didn't think of that 
uh, negligent homicide, increasing the penalties. Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a big issue, and it's a big big concern of mine. Uh, Patricia Rucker spoke spoke of it. And that still uh, hasn't gotten through, correct? It still hasn't gotten through. Uh, it's a big concern of mine as well. She, she made several attempts at it. I I had a really good bill th- this year, uh, and uh, couldn't get a hearing in the the, the judiciary committee uh, committee. Uh, R- R- Senator Rucker got it through the Senate, so I thought, well, okay, let's see if we can get it through for the Senate version of the House, and I had some ideas on that. Uh, the problem is, for the, the viewers and the listeners who haven't been aware of this, if you want to kill somebody, the, was, the way to do it with the least, uh, the, the least impact to yourself is to run over them with a car because it's, not, it's just a dis, uh, misdemeanor. It's not a felony. What is the argument well, against if, that? If you intentionally that, hit somebody yeah. with your car, that's still going to be first-degree murder. Yeah. And, and let, let me just also for viewers and the listeners, negligent homicide only refers to vehicles. Right. It, it should be called vehicular manslaughter, but it's called negligent homicide. But if, you do, if, it's, a, um, if it's something else, then it's involuntary manslaughter. But the bill would would raise it from a misdemeanor to a to, to a felony. What's the argument on the other side? What's the resistance to doing that? The pro well, drag racing on the street lobby is very strong in West Virginia. <laughs> I, I haven't had seen any cogent argument against it. Uh, my concern, and I thought about this a lot. I I have lobbied the uh, the uh, Tom Fast, who's a good friend of mine, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Now he's not coming back because he's running for another office. Uh, there's going to be a lot of changes in the Judiciary Committee next year, which will be interesting. But uh, and even uh, the majority leader, uh, um, Paul Espinoza or uh, Eric, uh, er- Eric, uh, and also the president pro tem, Paul Espinoza, uh, lobbied the, uh, the 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 chairman of the committee. So either the chairman of the committee or the speaker of the house didn't want that bill bill to move. Uh, that that's my definition. I'm going to have some more conversations uh, during the interims with the Speaker of the House and see what can happen to that bill because I, I just I just think it's an issue that's, that we, we need to move forward on. Who was the lead sponsor in the House on that, Larry? Is that your bill? In, that, in the House, I was the lead sponsor. All right. Have you built a big enough coalition of people who, when they see your name on the bill, they say, we got to help push this through because Larry's done this for us? Yeah, yeah. Uh, to brag a little bit, uh, if a bill gets out of committee on the floor, I can swing 10 to 15 to 20, 20 votes. Uh, if we get a committee of that uh, of this bill in the Judiciary Committee, uh, assuming what other amendments have to be made, and it's passed by the Judiciary Committee, I think it'll pass by a pretty good margin, and I think it'll pass by a good margin mm-hmm. in the House. I don't think we'll have a problem in the Senate. I want to circle back to the truancy issue and absenteeism okay. with, with, with teachers and such. Um, what levers are available for the legislature to pull to change that? I don't think it's a money issue. It's what, not a money issue. So what do you do? What's a, and that's why it's so sad that we, we lost that bill uh, for time constraints uh, on teachers being able to essentially eject students that are unruly. And, of course, when you eject students like that, you want to make sure they have some kind of educational opportunities just as long as they're not um, – disturbing others one of the things that's been really effective that we've done with the legislature and like we like us to do more of it is the mountaineer academy that's been very very successful uh, turning people around but this is not a money bill this is a classroom behavior bill and i think even though teachers are grossly underpaid and underappreciated as well as their support staff i think teachers would really welcome and they've told me that they would really welcome more authority in the classroom uh from them to actually do what they want to do teach but we've heard on the show that across across the state more than 20 percent of students i believe miss more than 20 percent of of the school year right here so that that's a big number on on both sides. I don't know how you get because that sounds like a family thing. Yeah, I more, think so. More than it is a legislature thing. I, so is is there something that the legislature can do to get kids out of bed and to the school? It's 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 rough, uh, and part of the problem uh, goes goes to the family uh, and uh, with grandparents raising. Grandparents, grandkids. Ra- raising kids. I have. We have a problem. neighbor of ours, and I don't want to in- embarrass this individual, but she's a grandmother. She's got 
five grandchildren that she's raising, uh, all boys. Uh, one of them has some developmental disabilities, and she's just really struggling uh, to, to provide for these, these kids. One of them has a behavior problem, in um, addition to the uh, de- developmental disa- disability, and she's really struggling. In fact, last year, uh, she had to make some decisions to whether to pay for heating or eating. Uh, so a lot of families are struggling, um, and getting their kids to school, sadly, is not a big priority. Larry Kump, our guest here on the program, he is a delegate on the Judiciary Committee as well. Larry, you mentioned uh, teacher absenteeism, and one of the things that is cited over this, uh, because I understand it's grown in recent years, is the use-or-lose policy that was changed with the sick days. You, right. you could accumulate those, then it became kind of a use-or-lose. So that If you're a teacher and you're going to be faced with losing days, why would you not take them? Have you considered changing that back to the way it was? I think I think that would be a good change because it's just common sense. If you have a use-or-lose policy, well, you're going to use it. Uh, one of the concerns I have about what's going on with our teachers is that our educational success right? if you want to call it that, uh, is not really good in West Virginia, though we have some really fine teachers, uh, really dedicated teachers. But the money per capita we spend for students is much higher compared to, compared to other states than it is with our, our education success rate. We have an awful lot of bureaucracy uh, at the uh, State Board of Education. Uh, and, of course, the members of the State Board of Education, I think they have a nine-year term and they're they appointed by the governor yes. uh, there's no accountability and the education department we had a constitutional amendment to give legislative oversight of the education de- department all of the other state agencies have legislative oversight over the rules and regulations but the voters said no 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 we don't want to do that uh, so the state board of education i really think we need a state board of education but we don't need a behind uh, a, a monster agency that is not res- as responsive as it should be. When we bring up that dollar figure to Dale Lee or Fred Albert, the teacher unions presidents respectively, they cite the fact that that uh, dollar amount spent on education includes the pension fund catch-up money from when it was underfunded for so long for state employees that if you take that out, West Virginia actually doesn't spend that much comparatively on education like the other states do. I wouldn't go that far, but one thing I will say that I'm really proud, and it, I'm not the one to take the credit of this, but it goes back several years or more, that the legislature has more fully funded uh, all the public pensions, uh, much more so than most other states. Uh, our pension systems are sound now. Uh, now, the problem I have with the pension system for teachers and state employees is that when uh, you retire, there's really no cost of living, and the longer you retire, the lesser that pension is. Uh, so I think that we really need uh, more attention on our retired state employees and public employees as far as their cost of living for their pensions. If you retired 30 years ago at $1,200 a month, 30 years later, that's not the same money. And particularly now, with inflation going the way it is, it's a real issue. Larry, any final thoughts before we end our segment? Well, uh, I try to keep up on all the issues, uh, so check my website, Larry Kump, K-U-M-P dot com, and uh, for sure and for certain, and God bless you all real good. Thanks for coming in, Larry. Thank you. Delegate Larry Kump at 901, and uh, Larry unchallenged in the primary uh, this year, so uh, first time in a while you can say that, Larry. In the general, too. I'm yeah, you're, you're walking all the way through. Yeah. It's a different world for Larry Kump this time around. <laughs> <It is. laughs> So he will not be at our candidate forum April 16th and 17th. That's only for those being challenged in their primaries. At 